postgraduate students from the four universities at this two-day online symposium. And we are also excited to see many listeners from around the world registered to attend the event. Thank you for being with us. We uh, appreciate very much the institutional support we've received in organizing this symposium and look forward to the continued support. So please join me in welcoming the four university representatives. The first speaker will be Professor He Lianzhen, Vice President of Zhejiang University. Professor He, please. Thank you, Mi. Dear Professor Bluff, Professor Wang, and Professor Rex Wami, distinguished professors, colleagues, and students. On behalf of Zhejiang University, I'd like to welcome you to the Asia Pacific Carbon Neutrality Symposium, jointly organized by the University of Sydney, National University of Singapore, the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, and the Zhejiang University. We are privileged to have eminent speakers from these four top universities in Asia Pacific region to share their expertise in addressing carbon neutrality. The whole world is facing pressing challenges ranging from climate change to energy crisis and the coronavirus pandemic. It is therefore becoming ever more urgent for the globe to accelerate actions for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. It is commonly recognized that universities as knowledge hubs have a unique advantage in responding to social challenges through academic prowess, research, innovation, and the service, and therefore should play important roles in implementing the SDGs. In March 2021, Zhejiang University launched a Sustainability Action Plan, a global ZGU for social good. It serves as a blueprint to improve sustainability-related education, research, and practices, not only within ZGU, but in the wider community, home and abroad. We are keen to scale up engagement with partner universities around sustainable development. In this regard, Zhejiang University is pleased to co-organize a quadrilateral symposium with partner universities. The University of Sydney and the University, National University of Singapore are long-standing and valuable partners to us. We share many common goals and values in educating global talents and resolving the world's shared challenges and have established sustainable collaborations in a wide range of areas. We are also very glad to have Indian Institute of Technology Madras to join us and contribute scientific insights and the best practices from India. During this two-day symposium, our scholars will meet online to delve into one of the world's most urgent missions, carbon neutrality. We invite you to share your university's approach to sustainability, carbon capture, and the utilization, sustainable energy, and the sustainable cities, which are all heated topics in the area of carbon neutrality. By engaging senior professors, early career researchers, and the PhD candidates, the symposium will promote knowledge sharing and the transfer across universities while nurturing opportunities for collaborative initiatives. With that, I'd like to conclude my remarks. I look forward to an inspiring and fruitful symposium. Thank you, thank you very much for your welcome speech and presentation. Now let's welcome the second speaker, Professor Kathy Belov, Interim Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research at the University of Sydney. Kathy, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Min, and thank you, Leanne. Um, it's wonderful to be here with all of you today. And can I just start by saying that on behalf of the University of Sydney, I'd like to offer my warmest congratulations to Zhejiang University as you celebrate your 125th anniversary. I believe it's next month that you celebrate 125 years, and we really wish we could have been there with you to celebrate in person. Zhejiang is internationally recognised as one of China's leading universities and 
that to you that you've achieved such great success with your determined efforts to seek truth and pursue innovation. And I'm really delighted that Sydney can count Xie Zhang as one of our closest international partners. So happy birthday. Um, but now welcome to everybody. I would like to acknowledge that I'm sitting on Walla Medical land. Um, so um, it is a custom in Australia to acknowledge the Indigenous lands on which we sit. And I know my colleagues are spread across different Indigenous lands. So I acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. And it's lovely to be here amongst such brilliant colleagues and such wonderful partners. At Sydney, we count Xie Zhang, NUS and IIT Madras as some of our closest collaborators. And as you know, we've really been focusing over the years in building a tight network of international partners. And the universities gathered here today represent the best in the Indo-Pacific region. So I know that we're going to be expecting great things from this forum. As Leanne mentioned, it's really sobering to think that with COVID still creeping dangerously around the world and with the war in Europe, there's an even more um, important issue lurking in the shadows. We fervently th hope that science will triumph over COVID and that diplomacy and humanity will put an end to the horrors in Ukraine. But we, with climate change, we can't afford to hope. We need to act and we need to act immediately. We've only got one chance to get this right. And unfortunately, we can't rely on individual governments with their short term and narrow thinking to provide global answers. If we need evidence of that, it came from the publication this week of the third IPCC report, which makes it clear just how far governments are from meeting their commitments under the Paris Agreement of 2015. So far, only three countries around the world have achieved carbon neutrality, Bhutan, Suriname and Panama. And in Australia, China, India and Singapore, carbon neutrality is still decades away, scheduled for between 2050 and 2070. The IPCC report um, makes clear that the wealthy developed nations continue to be the biggest contributors to the, global, to the climate crisis. The average North American emits 16 tonnes of carbon dioxide each year, compared to just two tonnes for the average African. But if the developed world is the problem, it's also where we must look for solutions. In these circumstances, it's vital for universities to take on an active and vocal role, to set the agenda, to gather evidence and to change minds. It's a chance for universities to take the lead on the biggest existential challenge we have ever faced and to help us not just meet our carbon neutrality targets, but to comprehensively beat them. Looking through the list of participants over the next two days, I know we have people here who can do just that. We have an incredibly talented lineup of speakers. So many thanks to Zhe Zhang for organizing the forum. It's an incredibly important event and a continuation of the remarkable work that they and other Chinese universities and research bodies are doing in the SDG related research, particularly in a, um, relation to affordable and clean energy and sustainable cities and communities. Thank you also to NUS and IIT Madras for their behind the scenes work um, to bring everything together over a long series of committee meetings. In a world where universities are under constant pressure to prove their value to society and the wider world, the challenge posed by climate change gives us an ideal opportunity to show the contribution that universities can make, especially when we work together as global partners. Thank you. Thank you, Cathy. Thank you very much. Yeah, we fully agree, as you say, that in addressing this grand challenge, we need to act immediately and also act together. Now, I would like to invite Professor Ruben Wong, Associate Vice President for Global Relations, the universe, National University of Singapore, to speak. Professor Wong, please. Thank you. Thank you, Li Min, and thank you, Professor Herlinton, for organizing 
uh, and coordinating with three other universities for today's symposium. So good, good morning and good afternoon, colleagues, friends and, co and students. It gives me great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to the speakers and participants from all over the world joining us today in this two-day Asia-Pacific Carbon Neutrality Symposium, jointly organized by Zhejiang, the University of Sydney, the National University of Singapore, and the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. The pandemic has impacted global mobility and international education with long-lasting effects. As we transition from a pandemic to endemic setting, we need to keep our focus on the shared goal of sustainable development and keep sustainability at the core of everything we do. The UN Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, can only be properly addressed through inclusive partnerships at the global, national, and local levels. Through research collaborations across boundaries and disciplines, we harness the strengths of our diverse backgrounds and experiences. And I hope that this symposium will be a start to that. Universities play an important role in the promotion and pursuit of sustainability through education, research, governance, and operations. NUS's president, Professor Tanning Chai, stated, universities are in a privileged position to respond to the climate change challenges by harnessing the knowledge and creativity of our faculty, researchers, and students, and by using our grounds intentionally. We do not take this privilege and responsibility lightly. As the global university based in Asia and Singapore's flagship university, NUS is committed to advancing sustainable development and contributing to the global fight against climate change. NUS aims to foster a culture and appreciation for sustainability issues by recognizing the interdisciplinary nature of sustainability and climate change education and research and leveraging the university's intellectual resources across numerous academic disciplines. We aspire to deliver quality education for our students, both undergraduate and graduate, to help them realize aspirations and fulfill responsibilities in an increasingly complex world. We are deepening our research capabilities and forging partnerships and collaboration synergies locally and globally to generate sustainable solutions for economic and social development together with environmental protection. According to the NUS Sustainable Review 2017 to 2020 report, NUS reached a significant milestone in its sustainable sustainability journey in 2020 and surpassed the goals set for all its environmental focus areas, except for energy, which well came close to the target. Despite a continually expanding campus, energy use, water use, and waste generated have seen downward trends for 2017 to 2019, with a sharp decline in 2020. Uh, and we hope this will continue post-COVID. The number of building and construction authority green marks the certified buildings on campus stands at 50 today, exceeding the original target, while the area of green spaces in buildings crossed the 45,000 square meter target. The university's carbon emissions have also reduced significantly. Overall, there has been a 56% reduction of carbon emissions against business as usual levels, exceeding the 23% target we had set for ourselves. Integrating sustainability and climate action in all of our activities is aligned with NUS's guiding principle of excellence in teaching, research and innovation and public service. On this no note, I would like to thank the organizing committee for putting this virtual symposium together. We hope the participants will enjoy the discussions at this two-day symposium and pave the way for further collaboration in these areas among our four universities. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wong. We all believe that university can play a very important and critical role in implementing U.S. 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And also, we need to work with our global and also regional national partners in different levels. That's why we organize jointly with this uh, symposium. Now, our last speaker at the opening session is Professor Raghaswamy, Dean of Global Engagement at Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. Welcome. 
Please, Professor. Thank you, for, thank you for inviting me. I want to start by saying uh, that we are very happy and privileged to be part of this group with University of Sydney, Zijiang University and NUS on this very important topic. And I also didn't realize that uh, congratulations to Zijiang University on its 125th anniversary. That's uh, an amazing achievement. And I hope uh, the university goes from strength to strength. Uh, carbon neutrality uh, is a serious problem. It's not just a technological problem. Uh, it's not a scientific problem uh, alone. It's a, it's a policy problem. It's a geopolitical problem. So there are multiple dimensions to this issue. And um, in many cases, as academicians, we look at technology and then hope technology will solve the, solve the problem. But here is an unique opportunity where, you know, whatever technology you come up with, there are lots of other aspects that need to be really taken into account before we can solve this problem. And hence, groups like this, academicians working together, are critical to be able to uh, solve this problem. And more dialogue is of critical importance so that we understand each other, we understand the technologies that are out there, and we understand how to deploy these technologies if for the first time really in a global manner such that these problems are addressed. So in that sense, it's a wonderful opportunity to be here. At IIT Madras, I just want to quickly uh, let you know that we have started an energy consortium looking at renewable energy, which is part of the solution. Uh, we believe that you need to educate young children, uh, engineers, and so on to this problem. So we are looking at uh, uh, running a sustainability de design contest that will uh, kind of bring students together to start thinking about these kinds of problems at a very young age because they're going to inherit this planet for much longer than uh, we are going to. And finally, we practice what we preach. So we have started an initiative to look at uh, carbon uh, neutrality within the campus. So we've started looking at uh, how we can make our campus uh, carbon neutral and then slowly kind of expand that to, uh, you know, around our local region, hopefully the globe. Uh, so it's a great honor to be here and I'm really happy to be here and hope the symposium uh, is very successful. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ramaswamy. Um, so we feel very pleased to have you with us too. And thanks again to all the speakers. And I will also like to acknowledge, I think, the uh, gracious efforts and amazing work of colleagues at the international offices of uh, the four universities for organizing this event too. And that's the end of this opening. Thank you. Please stay with us. The first session themed university approach to the sustainable research will start soon. I'm going to hand it over to the chair, Professor Ken Tai Yong from the University of Sydney. Professor Yong, the floor is yours. I give it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Li Min. Thank you, everyone. You know, uh, so again, you know, uh, good morning and afternoon you know, to all our colleagues at the University of Sydney, Zhejiang University's National Union of Singapore and Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. Uh, my name is Ken Tai. You know, I'm the Associate Dean for External Engagements in the uh, Faculty of Engineering at the University of Sydney. So I hope all of you are doing well and we are looking forward to visit some of our colleagues in Singapore, China and India in the very near futures, especially when the international travels have started to resume in many countries. So first and foremost, again, you know, I'd like to welcome all of us to participate in this uh, Asian uh, Pacific Carbon Neutrality Symposium. So this organized symposium is very timely and it's a very crucial platform for us to discuss how different universities can collaborate together to promote awareness for carbon neutralities. Um, not long ago, the Secretary General of the United Nations have made uh, strong remarks about our climate situations for the next few years to come. So he mentions that we are on the fast track to climate disasters, major cities underwaters, unprecedented heat waves, terrifying storms, and widespread of water shortage, so, and even extinctions of various species itself. So the UN has prepared a detailed report about the current uh, climate situation. So basically the report highlights that uh, to contain the global warmings, uh, drastic parts of fossil fuels are needed, along with creating more forests, eating less meat and technological to tackle CO2 in the atmospheres. So as of today, uh, the reality is that you know, the greenhouse gas emissions, which are actually causing the global warming, uh, at, are at their highest level in the human histories. But changes in the sectors from agriculture, transport to energy and buildings can turn things around. A shift to renewables will certainly mend our global energy mix and offer hope to millions of people impacted by harsh climates today. Um, so I think it is time for us to think creatively, innovatively, and productively to solve the net zero challenge together and start 
harvesting the abundant uh, renewable energies all around us using various technological approach. So in order to promote the awareness of this current climate impact, the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Sydney has created and led the Net Zero Initiatives. So the initiatives was launched on March 18, 2022, and it was uh, supported by the University of Sydney's. Many of our global partners and colleagues have participated in these events online. Some of our international partners have also joined our initiatives. So taking these opportunities, uh, we would like to extend our Net Zero uh, Initiative memberships to our colleagues in uh, Zhejiang University's National University of Singapore's Indian Institute of Technology Madras. We hope that this platform can serve uh, as a bridging vehicles for us to develop research collaborations, education exchange programs that will allow us to speed up the process of achieving carbon neutrality and solving the net zero challenges soon. So without any further delays, uh, let me introduce our first speakers, uh, Professor Gao, uh, Gao Xiang, and he's actually going to educate us a little bit on the perspective on suitable developments and carbon neutrality at Zhejiang University. And Professor Gao is actually the Dean of College of Engineering and uh, Energy Engineering at uh, the Zhejiang Universities. So Professor Gao, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yu. Thank you, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon. It's my great honor to share perspective on sustainable development of carbon neutrality at Zhejiang University in this symposium. Climate change is a global challenge for sustainable development. Our adversary in the indicator The rapidly raise the global meaning temperature, cause a global climate change, maybe abnormal climate change, and also the melting glacier and the sea level rise. In response of the global climate change, China pledged to achieve the carbon dioxide emission peak before 2030. Carbon neutrality about 2060. In the meantime, after COP26, more than 150 countries and regions worldwide have as submitted and updated their national determined contributors. So far, the net zero pledge worldwide was covered about 60% global GDP and 66 global carbon emission. As we all know, Energy Foundation is the model of the modern civilization. However, energy consumption relation carbon dioxide emission. Practice of the largest emission contributor is energy. About more than 73% total emission. Therefore, carbon neutrality is the easy energy sector is the closing embryo in sustainable development and climate re resilience. Zhejiang University is the leading university in China, is a comprehensive university, many faculty and association, associated college and school will perform research on sustainability and carbon neutrality. We are working on several research and innovation space relating to energy, including the renewable energy and the re energy storage and the clean efficiency utilization and carbon, carbon dioxide capture, utilization and storage to balance both energy security and both carbon neutrality. For renewable energy, for example, maybe, maybe the, we're working on research and development about the solar energy and the, Offshore wind power. We also found the Jiaxing Research Institute of Zhejiang University supported to research and industry scale application and new renewable energy. For energy storage, we also developed develop and researched various physical and chemical engineering energy storage 
technologies such as a sodium L battery and super capacitor redux flow battery and some more energy storage. We launch, also launched the energy storage science and engineering measure, the new measure, cooperation with several schools and colleges. For example, the green hydrogen produced the renewable energy is the promotion of clean energy carrying and storage option. We establish a new research institute indicating for hydrogen, hydrogen energy. For example, for example, we study the what electrolysis hydrogen produced with renewable energy and high pressure vessel for hydrogen storage. We also work in the core stage conversion and power generation technology system for clean, efficient, flexible utilization carbon-based for fuel. For example, the coal. We also established the 2011 Project Collaboration Innovation Center for the coal stage conversion clean power generation technology joint with the leading university and the company promoting the clean efficiency Flexible utilization of coal. Maybe the coal can produce a liquid fuel, gasoline fuel, electricity, and some more in Asia. We're also working on the for the low carbon power generation. We will also work on the power generation technology user, for example, the MSW, a bare mass and Establish, also establish national, national engineering research center for solid waste energy clean, clean utilization technology and equipment. For also for the flue gas pollutant control and the carbon dioxide capture, we also develop the ultra low emission system and a high efficiency carbon capture technology for achieve the clean and the low carbon power generation with coal. In particular, the pollutant emission in the flue gas for the coal power, power plant unit is better than pollutant emission limited than natural gas turbine unit. Also, for carbon utilization is very important. Several technology routing that develop, developed produce sustainable construction materials through the carbon dioxide mineralization and the carbon utilization. We also start a, a full process CCUS demonstration project to improve the high efficiency carbon dioxide capture and mineralization technology, which is the first demonstration in Zhejiang province. Also, the col collaboration, the crucial achieved our carbon neutrality goal research and development activity above the, above the are conducted in collaboration with the global partner, uh, such as the Princeton, Stanford University, Princeton University, UIUC, KTH. Uh, we also set up the research center with the, not with the university and the in industry partner from US, Europe, Australia, and Japan. We also cooperate close cooperation with the industry partner. This is uh, we have this partner with a focus on the carbon neutrality and sustainable development. The indication relating the sustainable sustainability, we launched the inter interdisciplinary measure relation sustainable development and carbon neutrality. For example, the energy environmental system engineering was established in 2003, the first international interdisciplinary measure in energy environmental in China. We also set up for I both before, we also energy storage, science and engineering, maybe the a new measure joint with the seven College and school across the Zhejiang universities. We also de develop. We also develop effort certificate training, training for students, training in college to participate, certificate research training 
for carbon neutrality, environmental protection, and sustainable development. This is the, the work, works by students from Zhejiang University. Our students were also awarded some, some prize in international and national and international. This, we also encourage the international education students encourage and supported for due degree. For example, we have the due degree, master and PhD degree with the KTH. Also, the Sweden, we also have the due and the master degree with the Kyoto University of Japan. We also have the students symposium for PhD students. For example, we have the China and the EU engineering education platform high level PhD school every summer. The, I have the four university, top university. Recently, we just uh, found a new laboratory, BIMAP laboratory, formulation cooperation with the Zhejiang Energy Group and West Lake University, dedicated on energy and carbon neutrality, or to help to build a sustainable future for net zero emission in different sectors, such as uh, such as the energy, manufacturing, transportation, and building, and so on. This is the potential cooperation with carbon neutrality and research and education. Maybe our four university, maybe renewable energy, clean low carbon utilization of fossil fuel, electric power system for new energy sources, low carbon technology for industrial building transportation sectors, smart energy, carbon monitor, inventory and assessment, carbon storage and carbon seekings, carbon finance and carbon neutrality strategy, and so on. Thank you for thank you for every every professor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gao. That was a, a wonderful presentation. I think we have actually learned a lot you know, from your uh, what Zhejiang is actually happening right now. Uh, without any further delay, I think because due to the time is actually quite uh, limited, uh, I would like to pass the floor to uh, uh, Professor Benjamin Eglinton, and he's actually the director of University of Sydney Nano Institute, and he'll be sharing with us about the uh, perspective on sustainability and energy diversity at the University of Sydney. Uh, ben, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, g'day, Ken Tai. Thank you for that. Can you just confirm you can see the screen and hear me? Yes, all good. Oh, good. I do have some Zoom stability problems, so let's hope this uh, stays with me. It's a great to be uh, joining you for this fascinating, really important discussion today. I've got 10 minutes. I'll move pretty quickly. I'm going to give some perspectives on sustainability and energy diversity at the University of Sydney. I'll start um, very high level, of course, last year was fascinating um, shifting um, in global uh, policy on climate change with COP26 and has really represented an important tipping point um, with global policy that has um, really affected uh, at a no local national level. And of course, the UN Sustainability Goals are really key drivers for universities around the world, including the University of Sydney. At a national level, our government uh, is embracing uh, net zero uh, innovation. Uh, we like to say the net zero um, the Australian way with a number of strategic uh, pillars that have uh, prompted investment in innovation, which are outlined um, as uh, summarised. And then at a state level, um, we have a government already that is investing um, and is very proactive as it relates to uh, emission targets. So the state government of New South Wales has set a 50% target in emissions by 2030 and to reach net zero emissions by 2050. So at a University of Sydney level, we've had a sustainability strategy for a while, um, a very ambitious strategy that has seen investment in a number of on-campus initiatives and targets to drive innovation, uh, particularly around living lab concepts. And I'll just draw your attention to a target that was set uh, in terms of 100% of electricity from renewable uh, sources. And there are other um, initiatives that are shown on that slide. Um, as mentioned by Professor Kintai Yong, the Faculty of Engineering has taken the lead on a very exciting 
whole of university strategy that deals with uh, net zero. Um, and you're going to hear, I think, more on that uh, in this conference. And that has four key areas of um, investment and focus, climate change, carbon removal. Ben, uh, sorry to interrupt. Sorry yes. to interrupt, Ben. Uh, the slide is not moving somehow. Uh, is it not? Is it not changing? Yep. So maybe you can actually uh, reload it again. Somehow, I think that because basically, I think just. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So that did not share, did it? Okay. It shared at the very beginning, and then. Uh, is that sharing? Shows. Yep. It is share. It is uh, sharing. But can you go to slideshows and then? Sorry, I have a, unable to see what I'm sharing there, Kentai. So I might have to. Okay. Can I try that again? Is that sharing? Uh, yep. Yep. It is. Ken, is that coming through? Yep, it is coming through, but not on the uh, full scale, uh, the, the slideshows. How are we now? Mm, yes. No, it's, actually, it's the same, it's actually still the same. But I think that, you know, it'd be good for you to just uh, keep scrolling down, you know, if he's actually unable to, um, you know, have the full screens. How's that, Ken? Yep. It's good. Okay. So let me be, get back in business. You can see that? Yep. Perfect. Okay. So let me wrap up that Sydney perspective no, no um, with the Faculty of Engineering, then Zero Emission and the Smart Sustainable Building Network that I'll come back to. Um, excitingly, the University of Sydney just announced, uh, indeed, that it has achieved a key milestone um, that is now 100% renewable electricity that's been generated from the Snow Hydro uh, scheme in the south of New South Wales. So that's a significant achievement and an important step um, in our progress towards carbon neutrality. University of Sydney is well equipped to uh, tackle uh, such grand challenges with the multidisciplinary initiatives that are outlined on this slide. Um, that bring together researchers across multiple faculties to engage and collaborate with institutions from around the world. And as Director of Sydney Nano, I'm just gonna spend a few minutes talking about the Sydney Nano program and how we are tackling some of these grand challenges um, with nanotechnology. Sydney Nano is a relatively new institute at the University of Sydney, formed in 2015, 2016, anchored in the physical sciences. And as summarized in this slide on the right-hand side, um, our current emphasis really spans across uh, smart materials, the life sciences, and renewables and sustainability. And obviously, I'm going to focus very briefly on the renewables and sustainability. 
And of course, all of our strategies align with those UN sustainability goals um, that are front and center. It's worth noting that the University of Sydney ranks are very highly on the uh, rankings according to the UN sustainability goals. We align with those Australian and national priority areas that deal with some of those key areas summarized on the slide. And at a local level, um, our key strategic imperatives are obviously to align with the faculties, carbon neutrality, quantum economy, health, and that emphasis on impact. Um, so very briefly, our research indeed um, aligns with the grand challenges uh, facing humanity. Um, and so just to talk briefly about the portfolio of uh, research across our uh, institute, again, that span across smart materials, life sciences, renewables, and sustainability. We have numerous nodes, and I just want to draw your attention to some of the key flagships in ecoactive building envelopes. This is part of a smart, sustainable building uh, initiative, capturing water from thin air, capturing and converting CO2 to fuels and solar fuels for energy harvesting. So roughly speaking, half of our research program uh, aligns with uh, the agenda of this workshop. The final thing I want to mention um, is indeed the Smart Sustainable Building Network that I alluded to earlier, which is the whole of university uh, strategy uh, that involves really completely reimagining the construction industry uh, from design uh, to construction and to operations anchored in nanotechnology, um, engaging externally with property developers, um, working across the university, bringing particularly engineering, science, architecture, design and planning. But there are a number of key benefits and obviously uh, reducing emissions because construction is a significant contributor. Finally, just some interesting um, uh, perspectives. A recent review article published by City Nano with a number of uh, leading research institutes in ACS Nano to give a perspective on nanotechnology for sustainable uh, future. And finally, to mention uh, that the University of Sydney is a founding member of the Network for Sustainable Nanotechnology. Um, and I would encourage you to uh, Google the network and uh, send me an email if you're interested in joining the network, because this is a consortium of institutions from around the world that work together on nanotechnology to deliver a sustainable future. Thanks very much, and I apologize for the Zoom issues there. I'm not sure what's going on. All good, Ben. You know, that's a wonderful talk. You know? And, uh, you know, it's giving uh, a broad overview for everyone to understand how UC is actually handling the uh, net zero challenge and the uh, overall uh, the key issues. Thanks, Ben. So the uh, let me introduce the next speaker, who is actually Professor Lee Po Singh. Uh, he is the Executive Director of Energy Studies Institute, Director of Singapore Energy Centers, and the Director of Center for Energy Research and Technologies, College of Design and Engineering, NUS. So today, you know, he's going to share with us about the NUS approach to sustainability research. Uh, Prof Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Yeah. Can you see my uh, presentation? Yes. Okay, thanks. I'll be sharing about NUS approach to sustainability the research. Okay. So we are adopting a holistic uh, approach when it comes to sustainability. While today's sharing is actually more on the research and innovation, uh, internally NUS is actually trying to bring together the education as well as campus operation, right, which will be integrated uh, with research so that uh, some of the research outcomes can be actually tra translated into actual solutions that the UNC can test bed within our operational systems and helping to the show that it's actually the uh, can be scaled up as well as to work with the industry partners in order to bring it to the next stage of uh, deployment. So in terms of the various research centers and institutes that are conducting research related to sustainability is actually uh, provided in this uh, next slides. So the, it actually uh, ranges from like the Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions, where colleagues are actively working on not more nature-based uh, solutions as the name implies, to the Center for Energy Research and Technology, where the mainly the engineering colleagues as well as our built environment colleagues are actually developing the solution, for example, for, for built environments, for industries, as well as, for example, data centers. We also have a centers for remote imaging, uh, sensing and processing, uh, NUS Environmental Research Institute that focus more on the water side of things, as well as even the urban farming. 
Then there's actually a green energy program. There's actually the looking at the more emerging or nascent technology, for example, pertaining to hydrogen as well as the CCUS. We also have a institute that focus more on the policy studies, for example, the energy, the studies institute, as well as the Institute of Water Policy. Uh, we also have one big center that is actually solely the focusing on solar energy the research. Then there's also the colleagues who are looking at biodiversity, right? The specifically within the Tropical Marine Science Institute. We also have a number of consortium, uh, including the Cooling Energy Science and Technology Singapore, Coolers SG, uh, which I'm actually directing. So we're actually working closely with industry partners so that the research performers can co-innovate and de risk various innovative uh, solutions together uh, with the industry and helping to uh, accelerate uh, the translations to commercial uh, deployment. And anyways, I should come up with a relatively the comprehensive research roadmap that actually spans from the near term all the way to long term. The, by long term, I mean so beyond 2030. So the, some of the programs that we have, right? Uh, maybe let me just cover first the, the short term programs, meaning within the next uh, five years. So we are still continuing the, our work related to water treatment, low energy desalination, right? But Singapore is actually very short of uh, fresh water resources. We also have a, a big group of colleagues that are actually looking at some of the urban physics right, uh, pertaining to like urban heat island effects, heat stresses, uh, as well as actually the, the on urban farming or agri aqua for food solution. Just recently, Singapore actually announced the 30 by 30, whereby Singapore wants to be at least 30% self-sufficient in terms of our food, food productions. In the midterm, we have actually colleagues uh, working on coastal adaptation, coastal modeling, as well as nature-based uh, climate solution, which I briefly alluded to in the previous slides. In the longer terms, so NUS recently secured substantial funding to set up the Center for Hydrogen Innovations, so the, for, for which colleagues will be actively working with uh, industry partners on car CO2 captures, green fuels, hydrogen economy, as well as uh, looking more forward, looking to nuclear energy. And the associated cap capabilities uh, or cross-cutting capabilities are actually shown in the second half of the slides, right? So NUS being a comprehensive university, so we have capabilities that ranges all the way from biological sciences, food science and technology, to sociology, uh, physiology, as well as techno-economic analysis and uh, pertaining to, for example, engineering as well as urban design and planning. So next, let me uh, zoom into a few the domains and provide a little bit more details. So the first uh, area is actually on urban heat resilient. So the challenge that we are trying to address is actually the urban heat island effect and high humidity, the, which amplifies chronic heat stress, triggering physiological, social, and economic impacts. And the objective of this uh, program is actually to formulate integrated solutions to enable multi-dimensional urban heat stress resilience. So some of the expertise that are actually residing in various uh, disciplines includes uh, design and environment. So firstly, we are look uh, colleagues from uh, architectural, as well as those that are actually the looking at landscape architecture, urban design, water sensitive, urban design, urban planning, computational and spatial modeling, design led research in urban planning and the planning and design. And on the science and technology front, so we have colleagues that are actually actively the looking at the modeling of urban heat island effects, looking at total per building performance, uh, ventilation, indoor air quality and health, energy efficiency, thermal and visual comfort, as well as phase change materials. And colleagues in engineering are actually developing cool and green materials and alternative low energy cooling technologies. And on the physiology front, so we have a physiological monitoring and impacts, human potential, intervention evaluation through human trials, and for societal resilience, so colleagues the, whose expertise are related to sociology, anthropology, social studies of science and technology, human geography, physiology, and physio-social resilience. And we also have colleagues 
there are actually experts in urban economics, firstly looking at design and evaluation through the economic analysis, solutions and measures for climate change adaptation across different skills. So basically, we have a team of professors and researchers who lead extensive uh, programs on resources of and responses to heat stress across NUS. And we're bringing them together to deliver the urban heat resilient uh, program. So basically, a multidisciplinary uh, approach is actually adopted. Next, I'd like to briefly introduce our program related to sunshine to new energy. So the challenge statement is Singapore relies heavily on importing of energy supplies. And we are actually facing challenges uh, in environmental preservation and energy security, especially with the recent uh, global events that's actually happening. So the program objective is to develop scalable technologies that can convert sunlight, CO2 and water into affordable fuels. So the expertise includes uh, those residing uh, within science and the College of Design and Engineering. So specific colleagues working on CO2 captures and sequestration, catalysis and separation, operations and institute characterizations, alcohol fuel synthesis and upgrading, hydrogen production and high throughput modeling, and AI in the catalysis development. We also worked through a Lloyd's Register Foundation Institute for Public Understanding of Risk, specifically the looking at risk assessment and public communications. And on the policy sites, we have Energy Studies Institute uh, for which I'm actually directing. So we are looking at the energy policy and life cycle uh, assessment. So there's also the Logistic Institute, the Asia Pacific, uh, in which colleagues are actually uh, looking at logistic and supply chain issues. Then the Solar Energy Research Institute of uh, Singapore, which is actually focusing on the low cost, high efficiency solar cells development. So again, a multidisciplinary approach is adopted. Sorry. Next, let's uh, look at the agricultural uh, food technology. So the challenge statement, uh, as well as the project objectives are uh, listed in the slide. So Singapore being heavily reliant and heavily vulnerable to global and regional the imbalances in food supply and demand. So that's why the objective for this program is actually to develop novel and sustainable food and the ingredient solutions to strengthen the food psychology and to inspire uh, the planetary health. So some of the expertise uh, that actually the what we are brought, bringing into this program includes uh, those residing uh, within the, the domain of computer science, specifically colleagues with expertise in data science, machine learning, and uh, robotic systems. Then there's also the Department of Biological Sciences, whereby colleagues are examining uh, agricultural, ecology, food waste, uh, food domics, and disease monitoring. Then there are also expertise coming from the Department of uh, Food Science and Technology whereby they are actually looking at functional food and beverages, as well as uh, food and beverage processing and packaging the technologies. So we also bring the engineering, the uh, domain expertise pertaining to sensors, soft robotics, as well as the synthetic biology, right, which are uh, looking at the clinical and technological innovations. So next we have uh, coastal uh, engineering and food uh, protection prevention uh, program. So the challenge statement is actually climate change related sea level rise and increase in coastal region uh, flooding poses an accidental uh, threat to Singapore. So the program objective is to strengthen the national and regional efforts in coastal adaptation and flood protection. So expertise that are involved in these programs include uh, Tropical Marine Science Institute, where colleagues are actually looking at hydrodynamics oceanography, environmental process, and extreme weather, as well as Center for Remote Imaging and Sensing and Processing, whereby they're actually looking at remote sensing, data processing, and weather monitoring. We also have colleagues coming from Risk Management Institute, uh, in which they focus on the risk management and communication to enhance the public awareness of risk. Then the, on the policy side, there's the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, which help us understand climate change and its impact on ecosystem and society. 
and recommend the relevant uh, policy. Then we also have colleagues coming from Civil Engineering as well as Center for Offshore and Marine Singapore. And last but not least, colleagues are from School of Design Environment who are looking to are focusing on urban planning and design. And for the nature-based climate so solutions programs, the form statement is the current knowledge and technical gaps uh, impedes the full potential of nature-based solution to serve as credible climate change mitigation measures. So the program objective is actually to create an, an un, enriched ecosystem to manage and protect the natural ecosystems to mitigate the climate change. So the expertise that are involved in this program includes the Department of Biological Sciences. So they are actually focusing on conservation science and technology, environmental economics, nature capital accounting, mapping, monitoring and conservation of terrestrial, coastal and marine ecosystem. Colleagues from the Department of Geography are examining the blue carbon conservation, the mic and microclimate change. Whereas colleagues from the design and environments are actually looking at urban greenery, ecology of built environment, and design-led research in urban planning and design. Again, on the policy front, we have the Asian Pacific Center for Environmental Law, as well as the Center for Behavioral Economics. Um, yeah, plus the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And the last uh, program that I'd like to introduce is actually the debt pertaining to water treatment and purification. The challenge statement is Singapore faces increasing demand for water use and unpredictable climate events threatening its water security. So the program objective is to strengthen competencies and create an integrated energy water resource solutions. The relevant expertise uh, who are involved in these programs includes the engineering uh, uh, colleagues whose uh, expertise are pertaining to membranes fabrication and separation processes, microbial fuel cells, normal materials for water treatments and purification, as well as faculty of science colleagues who are working on emerging contaminants analysis and sensing and environmental chemistry. So on the policy side, we have the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, specifically focusing on water policy and management, as well as the Sawsville Hawk School of Public Health, uh, which is actually looking at the water and public health related issues. And last but not least, we have a Tropical Marine Science Institute, uh, which is focusing on environmental sensing and marine biology. So to really facilitate collaboration and partnership, NUS adopts a wide range of uh, models or partnership models to foster collaboration with industry partners as well as uh, academic uh, partners. So it can vary from like contract research. So this is mainly pertaining to a uh, uh, partnership with industry, but the, certainly the, we are very keen to engage our international uh, academic partners to embark on the research uh, uh, collaborations. Then there's also joint labs, corporate labs, as well as industry consortiums. So with that, I end my presentation. Thank you, Prof. Lee. Uh, thank you for sharing with us about this uh, insightful NUS approach to uh, sustainability research. You know, uh, appreciate you know, your, your sharing the information. Um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Legit Phillips, and he's actually the Dean. Uh, an institute chair of the Department of Civil Engineering at IIT Madras. And uh, um, Prof. Philip is going to share with us about the uh, IIT Madras Initiative to Achieve Sustainable Campus. Uh, Prof. Philip, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, for the introduction and giving me this opportunity. Uh, I'll be talking about sustainability initiatives at IIT Madras campus. So we thought that, okay, when we talk about sustainability and uh, carbon neutrality, we have to start from home. So that's what we did. Okay, so welcome to IIT Madras campus. Okay, anyway, we, we cannot meet in person. So okay, when we talk about IIT Madras campus, it is somewhere here. The Indian Institute of Technology Madras was a unique campus among the academic institutions of the world. The campus is spread over an area of 250 hectares. It is a residential academic cam campus consisting of faculty and staff residences, academic complexes, and hostels. 
IITM is located adjacent to the Gindi National Park unit for its rich biodiversity. So our campus is carved out of a national park. So we have to protect the biodiversity. So you can see that this is the Gindi National Park and this is the IIT Madras campus. So we are still maintaining our green cover. So if you see the campus, the campus is divided into different zones. We can, okay, so this is the residential zone and this is the academic zone and this is the hostel zone and we have large uh, area for open or greenery. So you can see here that less than 25 percentage of the land area is being used for okay, buildings, paved area, internal roads, parking and open to sky. 75 percentage is left for green cover and low lying area and all to protect the biodiversity. So we have abundant and diverse flora around 298 observed species, fauna around 35 species, including endangered species like the black bug, along with 12,500 students and 7,700 plus faculty, and 51 species of avifauna and an equal number of butterfly species. It is an ecological island outside protected area. Maintaining a green campus and contributing to carbon neutrality is a natural interest and a social responsibility for the IITM community. IITM started several initiatives and adopted unconventional solutions to conserve and protect its environmental and ecological obligations. Sustainable development goals engraved in IITM's mission, mission and master plan. IITM recognized that achieving sustainable development goals are essentially depend on their ability to adapt plans with regard to climate mitigation and climate adaptation. So you can see some photo snaps from our campus. Okay, we have all these endangered species and all. You can see a lot of deers and blackbirds here. And okay, along with human beings, okay, you can see deer crossing, Okay, all over the campus and we have okay, big water bodies in the campus. Okay, so the flora and fauna on the campus, we have around 530 to 620 okay, number of species in the campus varying from plants, butterflies and all. And there are challenges. Okay, so the key challenge faced by the black buck in IATM campus, it's an endangered species, habitat, food, water and other threats. So over the time, the administration undertaken several interventions to improve the habitat of these ungulates and to reduce the threat posed by the free-ranging dogs. Due to these efforts, the population of the black box has increased to 40 plus earlier it was 10. The, this growth pattern has also manifested in the case of the spotted deer population as well. And we also did reclamation and enhancement of waterlogged areas around 40 hectares and planted with native tree species that can sustain extended periods of water logging. These trees have the distinction of being a habitat for avifauna, both migratory and native birds. And the water conser conservation and management initiatives at IIT Madras, IITM is blessed with natural lake, okay, around 31 square, uh, thousand square meter with a net capacity of around 180,000 meter cube. This lake collects the surface runoff within the campus and the surplus from the Gindi National Park, which is located upstream. During the year 1920, an additional area of 25,000 meters square was added to the existing water body to facilitate additional storage of runoff water. This water body supports the fauna within the IATM for its drinking water needs, apart from being a niche habitat of fishes and amphibians and insects. Rainwater harvesting is also undertaken for buildings and we are storing it in different bore wells. So this lakes and okay, the rainwater harvesting supply of okay, the water for IIT Madras for around five to six months because Chennai is a water star city. Okay, and coming to wastewater recycling and reuse, in the campus we are re reusing 100% of the uh, wastewater generated in the campus. The overall reduction in the freshwater consumption is about 55 to 60 percentage. We are buying water, or one third of the water requirement only is bought from outside. 
other than that everything is recycled within the campus okay so we are using it for flush in gardening air conditioning and remaining water is treated properly filtered and used to fill it in the uh, lakes existing in the campus so the tangible economic benefit is more than 25 million savings on water bill per year intangible benefits are much more because many a times in our city academic institute has to close down because of lack of water so coming to energy management the main source of energy for iitm is the utility electricity grid about 1.8 million units per year okay we have taken many initiatives to reducing power consumption air conditioning is one of the major loads so we started using energy efficient air conditioner installations to optimize power consumption moving towards centralized air conditioning instead of having individual air conditioning and in academic zone the institute has progressively replaced all the light fittings with led lights solar water heaters are used in dorm uh, dormitories and greenhouse guest houses in a bit to reduce utility power consumption and iit madras has installed 3 megawatt of roof, uh, rooftop solar power systems okay this is accounting for our, around 10 to 12 percentage of the total energy consumption and we are in the process of installing much more so that we can meet all our energy requirement through renewable energy sources and other initiatives initiatives to reduce carbon footprint okay we have an environmental management plan and an environmental management committee so this committee look into each and every activity okay whether it is meeting the um, um, carbon for uh, reducing the carbon footprint or is it the optimum design etc the institute operate e bus service free of charge for those who wish to communicate commu between the various points of the campus this reduces the use of individual vehicles motorized transport use is prohibited for the vast majority of the on campus student population in a move to reduce emissions and improve safety eco friendly construction practices and materials green certificate are used okay all our new buildings are having green certification and we have completely banned plastic in the campus and we are doing segregation of all type of waste and it is mandatory you can see that okay this is the way we manage our waste and whatever is possible to recycle we are recycling and reusing and coming to sustainable buildings okay we are meeting all the regulatory compliances and for the construction we are using all green products and processes and we go for value engineering okay uh, uh, but we are not sacrificing use of preference and comfort and we do have smart buildings and air quality monitoring and all the things in the building and biodiversity i have already talked about we are maintaining our flora fauna and restricting our land use okay we do census of fauna and effective preservation of deer and black buck habitat identifying and elimination of key threats continuous improvement of environment preservation and con conservation policy and we meet all the regulatory compliances and effective land use and efficient management of green cover effective site selection and approval process for new construction and footprint we have all deer corridors black buck corridors and all we uh, make a distinction when we select the site for construction so you can see okay some of the activities okay whenever we how to remove some trees we try to transplant them in the campus so that we will not be losing them and we do develop okay have uh, grassland for black bucks by removing invasive trees so so that is the initiatives we have undertaken now coming to aligning of academic mission okay how are we doing creating lead, leaders for the future iitm's primary mission is to reduce to educate people and carry out research which would result in innovative solutions to the challenges faced by the society okay we have many academic departments and centers across iitm are working independently and in partnership in the area of sustainability which includes the cause of carbon neutrality iitm hopes to cultivate new leaders in sustainability and create innovations which will help society we have innovation cells and many grand challenges uh, towards this iitm offers a basic course on ecology and environment 
for all its undergraduate students. This is a compulsory course. And there are more than 20 undergraduate and graduate courses offered as electives, which are related to sustainable development, renewable en energy sources, climate dynamics, climate economics, and energy management. And IATM offers a two-year graduate program in environmental engineering. The majority of these courses are oriented to the course of sustainability. And we have Indo-German Center for Sustainability, which is a collaborative effort between IIT Madras and the TU9 and the University of Kiel in Germany offers one winter school and one summer school and we have many, many collaborative research programs under this umbrella. And IITM is proposing to offer a two-year international interdisciplinary master's in engineering systems, a new international center known as Global Water and Climate Adaptation Center between Aachen, Bangkok, Chennai, Dresden has been established at IIT Madras. Now coming to the research initiatives, we have large number of centers working on uh, uh, carbon neutrality, energy systems, sustainability, etc. The details will be presented by my colleagues in other sessions. The Department of Science and Technology has been funded the establishment of Center of Excellence in Climate Change, Adaptation of Hostile in Infrastructure, here we are looking into all aspects of climate change and its impact on coastal infrastructure and associated activities. And DST has established an inter-institutional center and water technology research and innovation center for sustainable treatment, reuse, and management of efficient, affordable, and synergetic solutions for water. And a new international center known as Global Water and Climate Adaptation Center has been established. And after IIT Madras had, has been accorded the status of Institute of Eminence, Eminence, it has established several prospective centers of excellence to carry out cutting edge research. Several, several of these centers focuses their research on issues related to sustainability and climate adaptation. For example, water and sustainability, energy systems, etc., are coming under this initiative. Now, Okay, this is the carbon dioxide emissions in IIT Madras campus. Yes, we have a long way to go. Okay, we, we are keeping a tab on that one. We are uh, emitting around 18,762 tons carbon dioxide per year. But, okay, okay we could uh, sequester around 5,196 tons of carbon dioxide per year with the existing green cover. We are trying to reduce our energy consumption okay, by going for renewable energy sources and all. So we wanted to make it carbon neutral. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Philip. I think that the, uh, our, our whole saying that the, because due to the, um, uh, the time limit of the time, you know, we have to skip the Q&A sessions, you know, I encourage any of our colleagues, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to email to our host. And then, you know, uh, uh, some of our speaker over here can actually answer through emails, you know, actually itself. Uh, with that, you know, I would like to thank uh, Prof. Philip, you know, for her uh, the um, giving us, you know, uh, sharing with us about this IIT Madras approach for sustainability research in her uh, campus itself. That's a wonderful talk. So with that, I'll end this session over here, and I'll pass. Let us move on to the next session. Then, thank you so much. You know, thank you. I appreciate your discussions and your valuable insight. I appreciate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I guess we'll start the session now. Okay, uh, first of all, welcome to this symposium. My name is uh, Professor Lo Wai Lam from NUS. Um, I'll be chairing this session on um, CCS or CCUS, carbon capture sequestration. Okay, so before I start the session, I just want to um, quickly flash a... Um... Okay, perhaps I could um, request the, um, the host, let me share a slide, please.
Bye. Okay, first of all, uh, before I started, also I want to share a slide which I just um, downloaded from the web yesterday. I um, just want to point out one important fact that um, fossil fuel will continue to be the dominant fuel for the world for the next 30 years and beyond. If you look at this source from the uh, International Energy Outlook 2021, with projections all the way to 2050, you see that um, while renewables has actually made headways, but then um, the main dominant energy will still be from petroleum and other fluids, including biofuels and natural gas. With this, what is the implication? That would mean that CO2 will continue to be emitted, and then this would be an issue. Hence, we need to look for certain ways to sequest the CO2 to be carbon neutral. And this session will be all about carbon neutrality using CCUS, carbon capture, utilization and sequestration. So in this session, we have uh, four speakers lined up and then they will talk about what they can do in terms of uh, CCUS. US. So first of all, I would like to present the first speaker, Professor Pravin Linga, who is a colleague of mine. And Professor Linga is currently the Vice Dean for Industry, Innovation and Enterprise at the College of Design and Engineering, a very important portfolio. Um, he's also a professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering in NUS. And he's also recognized among the world's most influential scientific minds and highly cited researcher in engineering by the Cervet Analytics. He's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. So without much, much further ado, I'll hand the floor over to Professor Linga. Professor Linga, please. Thank you, Prof. Lo, uh, for the kind introduction. And I hope... Uh, uh, I'm uh, audible enough. Let me share the screen. Okay. Hope you are able to see my slides. Okay, yes. let, let me start off as uh, Prof. Lo highlighted uh, in the next several decades. Uh, the latest report uh, from IEA clearly shows that uh, whatever the growth that we anticipate from renewables, which is important, it's still going to contribute less than 25% of the total energy mix. Uh, and I also have had uh, that data recently analyzed for another presentation. So which is important for viewers to know that uh, uh, CCS uh, becomes the key enabler to transition into a, a decarbonized or a low carbon uh, future. So my talk is uh, going to focus on the sequestration part. I would like to highlight uh, a technology that we are championing for the past four years with the support of ExxonMobil. It's based on CO2 hydrate based storage in deep ocean sediments. So uh, I'm going to skip this part, but the important uh, uh, point here is CO2 emission is the major contributor to global warming. Hence, in order to achieve uh, what was uh, proposed or signed in Paris Agreement, uh, CO2 has to be, emissions of CO2 has to be reversed significantly in order to avoid uh, the two degrees about the industrial level. So if you look at uh, CO2 as a uh, culprit, then, you, uh, then we are looking at CCSU, which is commonly called as carbon capture storage and utilization as the key enabler. And of these sequestration is central. Why do I say that? Because of all the 26 CCS projects around the world, which is of a pilot scale size, all of them are uh, related to sequestration or storage. Right. So utilization is one component uh, where uh, it is at the R&D phase, maybe next five to 10 years. Hopefully we will see some technologies coming up that could utilize CO2 in a large scale. The scale and speed becomes important when we talk about carbon capture, storage and utilization. Right? So currently CO2 is sequestered in uh, two locations, uh, depleted oil and gas reservoirs uh, or in saline formations, deep saline formations, as highlighted in the, in the slide here. But what I'm going to talk about today is about uh, a new way of uh, uh, storing CO2, which is not an alternative to existing two methods, rather it's a complementary, another way of sequestering large volumes of CO2 for long-term and stable storage, which is in the form of gas hydrates and in deep ocean sediments, huh? not in the ocean, okay? It's inside the seafloor sediments. Now, uh, uh, if you look at the capacity-wise, in a recent review paper, we have highlighted that there's more than 170,000 gigatons of 
uh, sink available to form, form CO2 in the form of hydrates and keep them there, right? Now, if you look at what is the required target for 2050, it's like a minuscule, a very small fraction of what is available out there as a storage potential. So with that, let me also give you a context of in ASEAN region, why we should be interested on one such technology. If you look, developing technologies for CCS in Singapore is, is going to have a broader regional and global impact. Uh, immediate regional would be our ASEAN region. Singapore's target is to reduce a total of 14 million tons by the year 2030. Uh, and unfortunately, we do not have uh, any storage sites inside the island due to our uh, uh, location and also the shallow depth uh, available around our oceans. Right? However, if you look at the ASEAN region, there is a potential to, uh, to store up to 6,000 gigatons around. And uh, based on bathymetry studies in the slide here, you see those dotted spots highlighting some uh, areas, potential areas for sequestering CO2 in the form of hydrates. What this also does is it enables Singapore perhaps to develop a CO2 grid or a carbon grid similar to the electricity grid around neighboring countries in the ASEAN region. So that's the outlook that I would say. Uh, obviously, it, it depends on a lot of intergovernmental agreements and, and policies and so on. Uh, let's, as researchers, we, 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 we should worry about the technology development, leave the rest to the government uh, to, take, uh, to take care of. Now, if you look at uh, how, how can we store CO2 in the form of, form of hydrates, there's an excellent speaker coming in the list uh, my good collaborator, Prof. Ragnish Kumar, is also going to talk about uh, the, the same technology. Perhaps he, he would cover different angles of it. Uh, just to introduce, if you mix water and CO2, you can form something that looks like ice, but it's not ice. It's called gas hydrates, right? What you see in the slide here is a naked view of uh, uh, CO2 hydrates formed in the lab, right? Now, uh, they look like ice, but you don't need to have, a, you don't need to be below the freezing point of water in order to form CO2 hydrates. That's an immediate takeaway. So the locations that we are targeting CO2 sequestration, the temperature is around two to four or two to six degrees Celsius. Right? Hydrates generally crystallize in three structures, but what is important for us today is CO2 forms structure one. Relatively high pressure is needed to form hydrates depending on the choice of guest and you need low temperatures. Right? Now, if you look at uh, how you can sequester CO2 in the form of hydrates, uh, two questions should come into the audience mind. One is, where do I sequester CO2 inside the ocean sediments? Can I go anywhere in the ocean, dig up a hole and put CO2? Perhaps the answer is no, but perhaps the answer is also yes, because there are several locations around there that can be identified. For example, on the left side of the slide, you have a phasic phase diagram plotted for depth versus uh, temperature. The blue line here, is the, oh, sorry. Just, so the blue line here is the CO2 equilibrium curve, uh, which de defines the three phase boundary, solid phase, hydrate, uh, yeah. gas phase, or liquid phase and aqueous space. The, green, the dotted green line here is the hydrothermal gradient. The brown uh, line here is the geothermal gradient. So essentially you can form hydrates in the area A, B, C, D, and A, right? But the area A, B, and D actually falls under the ocean waters. So we don't want to uh, inject CO2 there because if, even if you form hydrates, there's, there's going to be fluid movement and uh, keeping those hydrates in those regions is going to be extremely challenging. What we are looking at B, C, and D that is the a line where the hydrate stability curve intercepts the geothermal gradient. This is typically a few hundred meters below the sea floor. And as you can see here, as a representative, I've shown you thousand meters from the sea surface. Okay, so these are locations where one can actually form hydrates thermodynamically, right? So the next second question that would come into your mind is, are these hydrates going to be stable? Yes, nature has an answer for us. Nature has been storing methane hydrates for millions of years, uh, very slowly, albeit, but in an extremely safe manner. Right? So that answers the question, whether the hydrates would be safe and where we can store them. Uh, in order to establish a proof of concept, we started working with ExxonMobil. We wanted to look at first question that came to our mind was, can we form these hydrates and can we demonstrate stability? In order to do that, we created an uh, exclusive equipment, high pressure equipment that is shown in the slide here. We have the ability to form hydrates, uh, mimic oceanic sediments inside, and we have the ability to study the, the fate of these hydrates 
through high pressure uh, camera that is that is continuously capturing the images and in order to actually transition into the stability phase there are three steps in the experimental domain the first question is you need to form these hybrids we have been doing that for many years so we know how to do that uh, the second step is to submerge these hybrids in oceanic waters that is to create a water table that demonstrate a pressure of 10 megapascal right so that's what the second step is the third step would eventually be is to observe the stability of these hybrids through the microscope from the top and the side view i'm going to show you in fact uh, uh, the world's first uh, laboratory <laughs> demonstration of stability of co2 hybrids uh, what you see here is uh, a video that shows uh, how stable the hybrids are over a 14 day test period what you see here the red line is the temperature line the blue line is the pressure line so we hold the pressure and pre uh, temperature uh, uh, stable for the test duration and as you can see here so let me see that oops okay yeah as you can see there uh, uh, the the time stamp is shown at the bottom of the video what you see there is one day two days and so on uh, co2 hydrates are extremely stable in the test period that we have demonstrated in this paper recently published in chemical engineering journal uh, i would advise the readers to go read the paper there's more than 25 videos and and, and several experiments demonstrating the concept uh, in the interest of time i'm going to skip that but this is kind of the world's first stability demonstrated in a scale uh, that gives uh, researchers confidence around the world to work on this technology so what are the next step yes we are not done yet we want to develop methods tools to quantify amount of co2 that would be in in these stable locations after we inject and form them we also want to uh, uh, monitor the co2 concentration in the water table uh, right and we also uh, are focusing our efforts on enhancing the formation of liquid uh, co2 hydrate formation uh, which is ongoing uh, in fact the the effect of salts on this on this particular system needs to be evaluated the thermodynamic effect is known to us because of flow assurance however the kinetics kinetic effects are still unknown and we are looking into it in my lab we are focusing on demonstrating a long term stability of about 6 months because then that data can validate uh, the development of models and validate it so that we can predict the stability of these hydrates for tens if not hundreds of years right uh, in conclusion co2 hydrates presents a huge opportunity for long term co2 sequestration we can lock large volumes of gas the potential is huge uh, as i as i highlighted we have made significant strides in evaluating the stability of co2 hydrates mimicking ocean sediments in nus here and our initial findings of a much promise to develop this technology uh, i would like to thank our sponsors a special mention goes to exxon mobil they have been the key funding partner of our research on co2 sequestration i'm just a messenger here most of the work is done by my students uh, particularly fahed is the one who is leading the co2 sequestration project with that i would close my presentation thank you very much for your time okay thank you very much uh, professor pravin linga uh, that's certainly a very um, exciting technology a very good presentation so i hope uh, we'll see more of it in the future so our next speaker will be um, professor wu wei chi um, he's a professor at zhejiang university who also holds a jump position at the university of iceland Professor Fu has developed several efficient approaches, including adaptive laboratory evolution and intercellular spectral recompositioning to dramatically enhance photosynthetic efficiency in microalgae. So without much further ado, I'll pass the floor to Professor Fu. Professor Fu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lo, for your introduction. Uh, I think I will share my screen. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, today, I would like to introduce uh, this microalgal engineering research towards carbon neutrality. I mean, I have been working on this subject for more than 10 years, and uh, this is like an interdisciplinary research field towards sustainable development. And the first uh, of all, I, I would like to introduce a bit about this uh, host we mostly work on. It's called uh, like uh, microalgae. Actually, they are like uh, phytoplankton and they live uh, almost everywhere in the world. I and mean, where there are nutrients and the lights available, they can survive and uh, contribute 
And actually, microalgae, they can output, outperform land plants a lot because they don't need any roots, stems, shoots, and uh, so they have very high photosynthetic efficiency compared to land plants. And uh, recently, I think uh, maybe uh, like uh, several years ago, and people are working on this biofuel and the bioenergy field regarding this microalgae feedstock as the, the perfect third generation feedstock to produce these biofuels, biohydrogen, and uh, probably also bioethanol. And actually, microalgae, they are very diverse in terms of these uh, uh, groups. Uh, normally, we know like this green microalgae, it just look like the, uh, the, the plants, like trees, the color is green. And there are also many other groups, we call them the phylums, they are diatoms, even cyanobacteria, we usually call this blue, blue green algae, they are uh, bacteria essentially, but they also have this autosynthetic, uh, uh, oxygenic photosynthetic apparatus. So they convert CO2 and into valuable compounds uh, where they also release uh, oxygen. So this project actually I initially started in Iceland because they have this geothermal uh, power plants. And the geothermal power plants are already renew, uh, regarded as a renewable energy source and also they are highly uh, clean energy. However, they still have this uh, uh, release of this uh, uh, high concentration CO2. And uh, actually it depends on the different uh, geothermal wells. But, um, Oh, Professor Fu, I think we have lost you. Professor Fu, are you still there? Okay, I think he's back now. Uh, Professor Poo, are you still here? Oh, yes, he's here. Okay, yeah. I cannot hear you, Professor Fu. I can see your message, but I cannot hear you. Yeah, Professor Wu is um, trying to reconnect at the moment. So please bear with us for another half a minute. I know Professor Wu is trying to reconnect again. Hello. Yes, I can hear you now, yes. Okay, sorry for this inconvenience. Yeah, can you please share a screen as well, please? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yes, we can see you now, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I said we just, 
I just said uh, we developed two different strategies. One is from the ecology perspective, we call this adaptive laboratory evolution. So we can accelerate the evolution, which in the nature maybe takes uh, ten of thousands of years we, in the laboratory, we can uh, adapt this uh, microalgae species into the well-defined environment. Sometimes it's a harsh environment for their uh, growth. And uh, the other method we developed is the, uh, the intracellular spectral decomposition of light. We actually shift the excess blue light, which some algae species, uh, they think it's, uh, it's too much for their photosynthesis. And uh, we convert it into green and uh, some uh, longer wavelength lights so they can uh, maximize this uh, photosynthetic efficiency. So with this two uh, approach, we can increase this uh, microalgae growth rate as well as the photosynthetic efficiency in this uh, tubular photobioreactors uh, by more than 15%. Actually, this is the process we how we can uh, like adapt this uh, particular algae species into the environment uh, uh, and uh, to accelerate the evolution. And also we can increase the biomass productivity by 115% for chlorella. And this is a, a, a LG, a LED based photobioreactor. This is a prototype we designed and uh, used uh, the flashing lights to simulate this uh, actually the, the, the uh, photosynthetic process. And uh, more recently, we have adapted this microalgae to this uh, power plant uh, gases because they usually have very high concentration and they can cause this. Uh, uh, liquid culture pH uh, to maybe lower than pH 6, so which is uh, unfavorable for this microalgae growth. So we need to adapt them to this harsh environment and make sure they can grow as well as the normal conditions. So we use a lot of this uh, uh, adaptation and it takes uh, uh, several months and then we select the, the, the best performance uh, strings and also we do this uh, rna seq and a genome resequencing to analyze this. And we also identified the major pathways and genes involved in regulating how they can make them tolerant to these low pH conditions, which gave us like the unique insights into how in the future we probably we can genetically modify this microalgae and to make them like a perfect host to directly uh, Biofix the blue gas CO2 from these power plants. Uh, this is just the more, uh, more recent work. And uh, I think to summarize the, the microalgae cell factory, this is like photosynthetic factory, we can know that this is basically carbon neutral uh, process. And even this, is, I should call this as a carbon negative technology because it do fix this uh, blue gas CO2 and convert it into the valuable biomass and uh, uh, bioactive compounds. And also any kinds of these plant-based natural products, they can be produced in this cycle plant, the microalgae. For example, there are many pigments like the astrazacin and the lutein and the beta cantine they can be commercially pr produced from microalgae. And also this is a light driven synthetic biology development. And nowadays we are um, very interested in synthetic biology and this is kind of the light driven synthetic biology development for these photosynthetic cell factories. And also uh, this host, the microalgae, they have uh, available molecular biology tools and also many of this uh, uh, genomic sequence they are available. So it, uh, it's possible and feasible to do more uh, price like genome editing technology and to make this host uh, as uh, the, the one as we need. So uh, there are still some projects ongoing in my lab and also in the future, I would like to expand my collaboration with uh, my peer universities, uh, for example, NUS and IIT and the University of Sydney. And uh, this is like, a, uh, of course I open to all kinds of uh, collaboration because I. I have been working in this interdisciplinary field for many years. Uh, for example, I would like to do more like a, this consulting driven, driven marine bio perspective of this microbiomes. 
for this bio carbon fixation and bioactive compounds. Because we know there are many possibilities from this deep sea and from the ocean environment uh, compared to the uh, land environment right now. And also, we can also search for more bioactive compounds because if we just biofix this uh, CO2 and uh, it's not um, cost effective, we want to also produce more values from this waste CO2. And uh, the second part is also we want to develop more sincere biology work to advance this photosynthetic cell factory. So we can uh, do this design and build this new system and test and we can learn from this uh, process. And finally, we can achieve like a very cost effective photosynthetic cell factories. Okay, this is all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Fu, for this presentation. It's certainly very exciting technology that we have here. Um, next, um, I will then move on to the next uh, speaker. Our next speaker is um, Dr. Wei Bin Liang, um, who's from Sydney University. And Professor Liang, sorry, Dr. Liang currently holds an Australian Research Council Discovery Early Careers Research Award. And his research interests focus on the design and development of porous materials in a large scale for highly efficient CO2 capture and catalytic conversion. So, uh, Dr. Liang, the floor is yours. Yep, thank you for the kind introduction. So sorry, and sorry for my um, computer problem. My camera is not working. So, um, but I want to ask whether you can see my share screen now. Yes, we can see your screen. Thank you. Okay, cool. Yep, um, first of all, it's my great honor to share the recent research in our group, uh, our lab and the capability we can do at the University of Sydney. The research in our lab at the University of Sydney mainly focus on the design, discovery, and development of sustainable catalytic process. For example, the catalytic biomass transformation reaction and CO2 catalytic conversion reaction. In today's talk, I will focus to introduce you the recent work we have done on the catalytic CO2 conversion reaction. Carbon dioxide is the major greenhouse gas that contributes to the global warming and climate change. Efforts and resources have been devoted to developing new technology for CO2 mitigation. In addition to CCU, uh, CCS, CO2 capture and utilization, CCU is a very promising strategy to reduce CO2 emission. In CCU, CO2 is used as a carbon feedstock to produce value added products. However, the current state of art of CCU involves several steps, including um, CO2 capture, the regeneration of the solvent, and the conversion of the captured CO2. The CCS process usually rely on the temperature swing process for the CO2 capture and solvent regeneration. This process is very energy intensive because of the high theoretical CO2 sorption capacity and availability of low cost natural calcium oxide precursors. Calcium looping process based on the reversible carbonation calcination reaction of calcium oxide has been applied for large scale CO2 capture from fossil fuel power plant. The techno economical modeling of calcium looping process has estimated that the carbon capture cost was 16 to 44 dollar per ton CO2, which is competitive with the current amines bubbling technique, uh, costing about 32 to 80 dollar per ton CO2. However, the major limitation of calcium oxide based solvent is their low resistance to particle sintering during the multi cycle operation. Thus, a poor carbonation calcination reversibility is observed due to the inhibition of CO2 diffusion through the calcium carbonate layer on the calcium oxide surface during CO2 uh, regeneration. Our group devoted to developing efficient catalysts for CO2 transformation reaction. The target reaction includes the first uh, water gas ship reaction, uh, CO2 reforming of methane, and the tears reaction. Some examples of our recent work are shown in this slide. It is worth to noting that due to the chemical inert, chemically inert nature of the CO2 molecule, thermal catalytic CO2 transformation reaction needs to be carried out at elevated temperature under reducing gaseous environment. By applying catalyst and process engineering, effective and efficient catalyst has been developed in our lab for these reactions. Currently, the challenge of calcium looping process lies in the logistics and energy penalty, 
of managing the concentrated um, CO2, which must be transported to an underground injection facility or processing plant for the conversion of to fellow active products. Considering both the calcium carbonate calcination process and CO2 catalytic reaction are carried out at elevated temperature, we envision that the possibility of coupling these two processes in one reactor and develop an integrated carbon capture and utilization process, we call it ICCU, for subsequential capture and conversion of CO2 at the same temperature in the same reactor with no additional uh, heat input. A couple reactions are performed in a single reactor by switching the gas inlet to avoid the transportation of solid solvent. In particular, by using different types of catalysts, the ICCU process can be successfully conducted at high and intermediate temperature range with a different product distribution. First, the uh, refers, um, firstly, the reverse water gas ship reaction is one of the most established reaction to convert CO2. It is an endothermic process, high reaction temperature, uh, mostly uh, higher than 500 Celsius degree is expected to be more favorable for this type of reaction. In RWGS, CO carbon monoxide is the main catalytic product, which is industrially important and can serve as a feedstock for producing chemical and fuel fire fissure chop reaction. In our lab, a new dual function material, DFMS, nickel syria calcium oxide was synthesized using a one pot soil gel method. The resulting material were used in the ICCU process. In the cat catalyst formula, calcium oxide serves as the carbon dioxide solvent. Nickel is the main catalytic active center for the CO2 reduction, and the cerium oxide was introduced as a physical barrier to prevent the growth and agglomeration of calcium oxide and nickel oxide during the cycle experiment. First of all, the success of the material preparation is confirmed by PXRD and electron microscopic measurements. In the next step, we test the performance of the material in the ICCU process. The process is conducted at 650 Celsius degree under different gaseous environment. The figure on the right hand side uh, shows the scheme of the specific uh, reaction. First, the material is exposed to CO2 for CO2 capture. Thereafter, after a short period of nitrogen purging to remove the residue CO2 in the reactor, the gas inlet was switched to hydrogen to facilitate the CO2 desorption and the subsequent catalytic reduction over the uh, material. Catalysts with different um, calcium nickel cerium molar ratio has been tested. Among them, the calcium 1 nickel 0.1 cerium 0 0.033 was found to be the most active material for the ICCU process. Most importantly, in the cycle experiment, we found that without the addition of cerium, calcium 1 nickel 0 0.1 is not stable over recycling experiment. However, with the incorporation of cerium oxide, no change in carbon dioxide absorption and catalysis performance for the calcium-1, nickel-1, cerium-0.033 catalysts are stable over at least 20 cycles. Another possible CO2 reaction is the CO2 methanation reaction or Sabatia reaction. A Sabatia reaction is a strongly exothermic process and limit, limited by thermodynamic at high temperature. Thus, relatively mild reaction conditions can not only maximize the reaction conversion, but also increase the reaction selectivity to methane. In this catalyst design, Wolfenium was chosen as the catalytically active species. In literature, the desired temperature of ruthenium in Sabatier's reaction is around 300 Celsius degree, which is much lower than the temperature of the carbon capture using the calcium oxide-based material, which is normally 600 Celsius degree for carbonation and uh, around 900 Celsius degree for regeneration. Therefore, in order to achieve a successful and efficient ICCU reaction, the matching of the carbon capture temperature and the solvent uh, and the solvent and the conversion uh, temperature of the catalytic side is very important in the catalyst design. 
in this case, magnesium oxide is, uh, um, is chosen because the temperature for the carbon capture of this material is around 300 Celsius degree, which is the optimal reaction temperature for the carbon dioxide methanation reaction. However, pure magnesium oxide exhibits a moderate CO2 capture capacity, um, and the material is with poor thermal stability during cycle experiment. Thus, in this case, alkaline metal, lithium nitrate, sodium nitrate, or potassium nitrate was introduced during the synthesis of magnesium oxide to improve its carbon dioxide capture capacity. The dual, the dual function materials, ruthenium, cerium, magnesium oxide, is synthesized by a physical mixture of the synthesized magnesium oxide solvent and the ruthenium cerium oxide catalyst. Again, the success of the synthetic was confirmed by PXRD and TEM measurement. Uh, in the next step, we uh, demonstrate the ICCU process uh, at 300 Celsius degree. Under CO2 environment, magnesium oxide captured the CO2 with the formation of magnesium carbonate. After switching the gas inlet of the reactor from CO2 to hydrogen, methane was detected as the only catalytic product in the gas outlet. However, unfortunately, the tested materials are not stable. The catalytic performance of the materials drop after 10 cycle experiment. This is mainly due to the sintering of the magnesium oxide. Further experiments are, are conducted in our lab to improve this process. Um, so in conclusion, we have demonstrated that uh, we can use the ICCU process to uh, conduct the CO2 sorption and conversion at the same temperature in one um, reactor. And then the uh, catalytic product of the uh, CO2 conversion reaction can be tuned and fine tuned by the chosen of different uh, catalysts and reaction temperature. At last, I, I would like to thank the organizer for finding me this great opportunity to present the results from our lab again. This work is supported by a grand challenge scheme at the University of Sydney uh, Nano Institute. The research team consists of multidisciplinary researcher in the University of Sydney and directed by Professor Catherine Stample and Professor Jun Huang. And uh, last, um, um, this is all for my presentation today. And thank you for your kind uh, attention. And uh, all uh, questions are welcome. Um, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Liang, for the presentation. Something very interesting one as well. Um, now I'd like to introduce the next speaker, who is a Professor Rajnish Kumar, who is a professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at IIT Madras, India. And in the past, he has also served as senior scientist in CSIR National Chemical Laboratory, Pune, in India. Um, in the year 2020, he has also received the Dr. YBG Burma Award for Teaching Excellence in Chemical Engineering. He's a fellow of the prestigious Royal Society of Chemistry. Hello. <coughs> Hello. Can uh, is it my slides are visible to everyone? We can we can see you, yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so uh, thank you uh, for uh, this opportunity. And I would like to first uh, thank Professor Pravin Linga. He basically introduced this topic already. So probably I'll have to, I have an option to skip some of the fundamentals, but I'll try to complement whatever he has uh, talked about. So today I'm also here to discuss CO2 uh, sequestration using hydrate. Uh, since uh, pra uh, Pravin talked about sequestration primarily, I thought I'll uh, use a little bit of capture as well. So if you see, this is uh, the work which we do uh, in uh, IIT Madras. We have a consortium, which is uh, basically uh, made up of uh, many faculties working in complementary research topics. Uh, when it comes to capture, uh, carbon dioxide capture and sequestration, uh, we typically in our group, uh, uh, in our, my research group, as well as uh, some of my collaborators, we work on pretty much every uh, aspect of CO2 capture and sequestration. Uh, when it comes for capture, we are uh, we have multiple uh, sources from where it could be captured. So focus of my research group has been mostly point source capture, but others in our uh, uh, consortium works on direct capture on uh, from air. So focus of my research is to capture the CO2 coming out from point sources where the concentration of CO2 is roughly going to be around 10 to 15 percent uh, if you are using the conventional uh, fuel uh, uh, flue gases. 
or it can go to around uh, 40 to 50 percent depending upon the other uh, gas mixers which you uh, basically encounter in industry and then the next step would be to transport it and then sequester uh, pravin talked about the sequestration in gas added i'll just touch upon it a bit but uh, before we uh, move on, let me explain uh, what exactly are the options uh, one have when uh, CO2 capture is to be done. So when you have a CO2, uh, uh, other gas mixture with CO2 and the partial pressure of CO2 is significantly high or the composition of CO2 in the mixture is high, you typically use physical absorption or absorption based processes. Whereas when the partial pressure of CO2 is uh, much lower or the composition of CO2 in the gas mixture is much lower, you'll have to typically rely on chemical absorption processes and cost of capture as well as regeneration of the material is uh, around uh, similar in whatever you uh, do. So in the case of chemical absorption, the cost of capture is lower, whereas the cost of regeneration is significantly high. Compare that with physical absorption processes where cost of capture is uh, uh, slightly higher because of cryogenic applications, uh, but then the regeneration is significantly lower. Uh, the one other challenge with physical absorptions are that the capacity of CO2 capture is significantly low compared to what you typically see in chemical absorption process. And this is where the hydrate-based gas suppression process comes into picture. The capture capacity of hydrate-based processes are almost as high as what you would see in chemical absorption processes. And the cost, uh, typically the capture cost as well as the regeneration of the material which is used for capturing the CO2, if you uh, put it together, you will see that uh, the capture cost is significantly low in hydrate process compared to say when you are talking about amine process where you have a lower capture cost but higher regeneration cost. So this is the data which I'm taking from literature. So what we typically propose is that when you have a mixture of CO2 and hydrogen or CO2 and hydrogen, uh, nitrogen, you typically basically uh, mix this gas and water together to form a solid. So separating these gases when they were in gas phase was difficult, but when you convert one of these components into solid, hydrates, it's much easier for you to basically now separate. Now the gas phase is typically uh, depleted in CO2 because CO2 forms at milder condition and uh, 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 the, the solid phase which you typically uh, have as hydrates will have mostly CO2 present in it. So if you look into the capture capacity wise, the capture capacity of CO2 is around uh, of uh, CO2 or any other uh, gas in hydrate phase is roughly around 10 millimole per uh, gram, which is very similar to what you typically see in a uh, chemical absorption based processes. Compare that with uh, physical absorption process like Selexol and Rectisol, which is much lower over here. So this is one of the advantages you have in hydrate based processes for separating gases where the capture capacity is significantly high uh, where, and compared to Selexol and Rectisol and the process cost is also almost comparable to what you see in amine based processes. So this is uh, the concepts what uh, we talked about. So what are hydrates basically? Hydrates typically form uh, between a gas and water molecule. The difference is that uh, these are uh, similar to ice but can form above zero degree centigrade. You can form hydrate even at room temperature and that basically gives you uh, uh, much better energy economics compared to when you try to form uh, ice. Uh, one of the uh, reasons why you would be able to separate these two gases is that if you talk about formation of one gas, say for example, CO2 hydrate, uh, the phase diagram looks uh, uh, much milder compared to when you are trying to separate uh, form a hydrate of nitrogen. So when you have a mixture of CO2 and nitrogen, you will see that if you form some hydrate somewhere over here, you will see primarily the hydrate phase will have CO2 and that, that basically separate the gases from uh, these two um, gas mixtures. So we have demonst demonstrated some of these processes where you have a gas mixture going in from one end and then uh, you get a pure gas from the other end and the working liquid is just water. You don't have to really bother about uh, uh, regenerating or even if you regenerate it, the cost of regeneration is significantly lower compared to any other amine or any other such molecules. The separation factor is uh, quite uh, decent. So for every 36 CO2 molecule, there will be one nitrogen molecule in the hydrate phase. And when you're talking about CO2 and hydrogen mixture for every 98 molecule, there will be one molecule of hydrogen in the hydrate phase. So basically the separation factor is also significantly good. In our lab, we look into the kinetics and other uh, such uh, pro uh, problems, how to basically enhance the kinetics. So this is one of the hydrate sample, which I saw from my lab, uh, which was basically generated in this uh, setup, which is a multi bed reactor. We have a patent for this uh, reactor design as well. So what you basically have uh, done that we uh, look into kinetics of hydrate formation, how you can basically separate the uh, two gases when you are forming hydrate. So we look into fundamental aspect as well, how we can generate uh, hydrates with crystal defects, which will somehow enhance the properties of uh, uh, hydrate being a separate uh, separation uh, system. 
So we have demonstrated in uh, in a pilot scale where uh, these reactors are uh, having uh, different beds. This is the kind of beds which you have and uh, you typically get a pure gas out of it. So what effectively you do is that you can use hydrates for first separating the gases from the mixture and then once you have separated the CO2, you can basically use it for sequestration. Uh, this is what uh, Praveen mostly talked about, uh, that if, uh, this is the uh, phase diagram which he talked about over here. If you see this uh, data is also taken from Praveen's group only. This is the stability curve which you see and then hydrates are stable over here as well as over here and as Praveen said we in our lab also basically work on uh, aspect of sequestering this CO2 as hydrate where you can basically have around 38 percent of CO2 sequestration in hydrate form. Compare that, that with CO2 solubility in seawater which is going to be 1 into 10 minus uh, 3 mole per mole. So this is significantly uh, richer in terms of CO2 and the capacity of CO2 capture is going to be significantly high. Uh, this is the kind of hydrates which you see. So this is what you basically learn from nature. There is already a huge amount of methane hydrate which exists under the seabed at similar temperature and pressure conditions which are stable. So there is nothing uh, you need to basically uh, worry about. Hydrates, uh, CO2 hydrates are even th thermodynamically more stable compared to uh, methane hydrate. So these are some of the experimental setups which we have. One of the other pilot plant which we have in our research group where we have CO2 uh, being supplied in liquid phase, liquid CO2 or supercritical CO2 with certain additives. And these are some of the injection and production line which you see where we study the formation of hydrate uh, in uh, real time at the conditions which is similar to seabed uh, up to 150 bar and 4 to 5 degrees centigrade. These are uh, some of the injection and production lines which you have in our reactor. And you basically see that depending upon what kind of reactor you use, if you are using a smaller reactor, you can form hydrate much quicker. Uh, even uh, the kinetics of this could be uh, significantly improved in presence of certain additives which we have already designed in our lab. So for example, if there is no additive, it takes like 35 hours for this hydrate to start forming. In presence of some of these additives, this happens within a few minutes to hours. So uh, the approach is very, going to be something very similar to what you typically use for uh, cell gas exploitation. This is going to be exactly opposite of that. Here you are going, instead of producing any gas out of it, you are basically pumping the gas and allowing this uh, gas to form hydrate under 100 to 300 meters below the seabed. Uh, the other approach uh, could be to basically look into uh, a capture of uh, CO2 in existing hydrates, which, you, uh, which is another option where you can basically, for every mole of CO2 which, which, you, which you sequester, you can produce one mole of methane. So the cost of sequestration could be uh, somehow compensated by the amount of methane which you produce from uh, these uh, experiments. So this is the kind of replacement experiment which we have done up to around 700 hours of uh, um, data which we have generated in the lab and then we studied the stability of these had it uh, in our uh, lab setup as well. So this is the research group which we have. Most of the experiments were done by the PhDs and the postdoc students in the group. If there is any question, I'm happy to take it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Rasnish, for the presentation. Again, thank it's very, very interesting technology. I think we definitely look forward to such technology being used in the future. Uh, next is giving me great pleasure to introduce the next um, speaker, who's a student speaker. Um, and his name is uh, Ho Chia Hao, and he's a year four mechanical engineering student from NUS. And I'm so very proud to say that um, Chia Hao is actually my final project student who have been working with me for the past one year on CO2 transportation in pipelines for CCS. So Chia Hao, the floor is yours. Okay, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you Prof for your introduction and thank you for the other speakers because I've learned a lot from the other speakers about CCUS. So today's my, pres my presentation is on the transportation of uh, CO2 during CCS under the supervision of Professor Lo Wai Lam. So the focus of this discussion would be on the transportation of C CO2 using pipelines because it would be the most efficient to transport within a thousand km radius of Singapore. And CCS is gaining some traction in the whole wide world, and Singapore is also evaluating the implementation of CCS. And organizations such as ExxonMobil is also showing some interest in CCS as well. So researchers such as Dr. Lau has also proposed in his decarbonization roadmap for Singapore 
that CCS is to be part of the pipeline for Singapore to reduce carbon emission. And a capture plant, as well as uh, existing pipelines, can be used to transport CO2. So the focus today will be on the transportation of CO2 in the dense or supercritical phase because viscosity is low and density is high. This means that the CO2 experiences smaller frictional losses and also more amount of CO2 can be transported at any given amount of time. So on the right, we actually see that there is this two-phase region and it is caused by impurities such as hydrogen, argon, oxygen, and methane, and nitrogen, which are the common impurities in gases, and they expand the two-phase region. So unlike the diagram on the left in figure four, the different phases, liquid, gas, and dense phase, are demarcated very clearly. But on the right, the two-phase region caused by the impurity eats up this region, eats up the liquid region. And we want, want to avoid two-phase region because uh, it can cause slug flow. So the two-phase region consists of the liquid and the gas. And slug flow occurs when the liquid uh, slug forms a hammer and causes mechanical damage on the pipe. So we wouldn't want that. So we have to increase the operating pressure to uh, avoid this flow. And hence, it will in increase costs. However, complete removal of impurities could be even more expensive. Hence, we have to uh, strike a balance for this. So my project focuses on the simulation of CO2 to understand the pressure losses in uh, the transportation of different phases, dense phase, supercritical, and both supercritical and dense phase, and also to understand the effects of impurities. So these simulations are conducted with accurate elevation and temperature. So on the top right, you can see that uh, using QGIS, a uh, quantum geographic information system, and we obtain data from the general bathymetry charts of the ocean, we are able to visualize a heat map of the elevation around Singapore in the South China Sea. So in the radar regions, we can see actually it's about 100 to 2,000 meters depth. Uh, and for the lighter regions, it will be a shallow depth of 0 to 100 meters. So the pipelines are plotted and we can see the elevation. And bottom right, we have the temperature profile for the South China Sea. So this is important because as the pipelines are laid on the seabed, we will need the temperature of the seabed uh, because it all factors in to the thermodynamics consideration. So these two information, the elevation and the temperature are input into s Hysis for simulation. So some interesting findings would be that the pressure losses for supercritical phase is the highest compared to uh, dense phase. And what are some of these factors that affects CO2 pressure drop would be density, velocity, and friction factor. And using a, a calculation model and compared against Aspen Hysis with a less than 0.2% variance in terms of the data, we are able to pinpoint factors that affect pressure drop more than the others, such as velocity is more than that of density, and the friction coefficient actually plays close to a negligible impact on pressure losses. So on the right, we actually have the effects of impurities on CO2. Hydrogen actually increases the inlet pressure more so than other impurities. And uh, this can be due to actually two different factors. One is to overcome uh, heat loss, which is pressure losses due to velocity and density. And another one would be the increase in critical pressure of the impure CO2. And notably, we note that at low capacity transportation, the increase in critical pressure plays a more important role in increasing the inlet pressure compared to pressure losses. And with that, actually, we can conclude that in Singapore, dense phase transportation CO2 would be preferred because the pressure drop is the least and if new pipelines need to be constructed, uh, it would be without 
insulation and would be much cheaper also. And uh, we note that also hydrogen should be limited or avoided because they increase the inlet pressure significantly compared to other impurities. So in the future, uh, in the future, different equations of states can be used to predict uh, CO2's behavior and compared to this project because this project uses the Fern-Robinson equation of states. And also uh, corrosion and pipe locations details could be further fine-tuned to improve the accuracy of the simulations. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Xiao Hao, for this presentation. Well done. Um, so we come to um, the end of the speaker session. So we will now um, go on to a Q&A session. So um, I'd like to um, call upon the first person to um, un ask a question. I think we have a question from ZYX, right? I think you've raised your hand. So would you like to pose a question, please? Or are there any questions from the floor? I mean, we were quite happy to get the panels to answer your questions. Or if you like, you can actually post the questions uh, onto the Q&A as well. You have two choices. Okay, perhaps um, is anybody um there to ask ask other questions? We're quite happy to ask any answer any questions here. If not, then I'll pass the floor back to the uh, the host and organizers. Okay, since there's no question, I think I'll, we shall actually um, close this session now. So uh, just a reminder that the, um, tomorrow's session will start with earlier. So I hope to see all of you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lam. Thank you very much. Okay, just one more reminder. Um, can you uh, please be reminded that uh, to log in at the same link as today, please. The link will be the same as today's. So you can use the same link for tomorrow. So we shall see you at 11.30 tomorrow, um, Singapore and Hangzhou's time. And I'd also like to say a big thank you to all the speakers attendees for today.
Okay, I just received one question, um, or two questions now. Um, the question is, what, uh, how, what's the possibility do developing countries, especially Asia, has to practice carbon neutrality? Perhaps one of the panelists can answer this question here. The question would be, what is the possibility of developing countries in Asia have to practice carbon neutrality? Anyone in the panel would like to answer this question? Okay, maybe we'll go on to the next question. Uh, next question would be, um, are there any use for the hydrates other than storage in the ground? Perhaps um, Professor Rashnish can answer the question if he's still around. No, I think he's left. Yeah, sorry about this. Unfortunately, most of the panelists has left. So I guess um, we can still ask the question again tomorrow. So in the meantime, thank you very much everybody for attending this uh, first day of the symposium. We shall see you guys tomorrow. Thank you, Professor Lo. We will end the webinar now. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. I see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.